And we know there are times where you don't match, where you go for some sort of triplet, triplet pattern or syncopation pattern or some sort of <clears throat> divergence, and then you come back. And James and I have talked a lot about that and we've played together a lot over the years. And I think that's what I love about great uh, scores and whether it's midsection and, and um, bass and tenor and the sides too. It's just that whole way you guys can match and not match. And I know you can play loud and soft and I know you can stop. And that's maybe more, more than what most pipers know about what you guys do back there. That's the number one thing you have to know. We don't know much. Number two, we know when it's good. We have sort of a gut feeling. You know, we can listen to a really good band or really great medley or when we're playing with you and it's working. We know that. We can feel it. We might not have the words to describe what we're feeling, but we know when it's in the pocket, when we're matching, when we're together, when the, when the unison in the ensemble is there. But when it's not good or we're sort of working through that, we're in the practicing and in the collaborations process, we don't always know why it's not good. We have a feeling of there's something not there, but because we don't know that much in terms of the technical details of what you're doing, and we certainly don't have the language to, to use, the, the language that you have, that can be a, a challenge in the collaboration. So we know when it's good, we know when it's not good, but we don't know why. So that's where we're really relying on you guys to say, well, these are the things that we can do. You know, so a, a typical example working in a pipe band might be a break. The break between the stress bay and the reel isn't quite right. Or maybe there's a point where we go into the second jig in the medley and you guys drop out, which is a really cool effect. And then you come in and there's something that isn't quite right where you come back in. And we're, we're, it's not, we're not in the groove there. So we, we need your help to figure out what's going on. You know, are we slowing down? Are the pipers slowing down when you guys drop out? That's a common thing that can happen. Are you guys coming in when the lead tip comes in? Is it not quite right there? You know, sometimes we have a sense that there's something funny going on with the score. Maybe it seems too complicated or maybe it's too hard for you guys. We don't know that. We can't say that. Only you know that. So we're asking for help. Is there something there in the score that you can adjust or adapt or reconfigure? Or is it a dynamics thing? You know, that accent doesn't seem to be coming in where we think it should be coming. Is that where it's supposed to be? So we need your help, right? So we have, we know when it's great, but we don't have the language and we don't have the expertise on the technical side of what you're doing to be able to communicate. And certainly we can't figure it out. We can, we love playing things. Let's try some different things. Let's try some different things. Try it like this. When, when I'm struggling, when I'm working with the band in Seattle and we're working on this kind of stuff, I'll say to, Greg, who's a lead drummer, I'll say, let's try it a few different ways. Because I don't know what you guys can do, but give me some options. You know, if you gave me a, you know, an empty house, I wouldn't be able to decorate it, but I could walk in and I could say, I like this. I don't like this. Give me more like this. So give us some options and let us let's figure out what works. Great. Any questions so far? That's Great. so far so good. And anybody that has got any questions, please pop your hand up or put a little message in the chat box. Uh, certainly we want this to be interactive. You've got an opportunity to ask questions of Yuri, so please feel free. Right. Number three, something that you guys need to know about pipers is that when the piping gets hard, our timing suffers. And what I mean by that is, if there's anything in the piping side that is challenging, the timing is gonna suffer, right? Whether it's, it's just a little bit too fast for us, or there's something in the in the fingering execution in the pipe tune that's challenging. You know, we've got a lot of our, you know, you guys have all your rudiments. We have our versions of that. We have our embellishments and our doublings, and you've heard about tachums and all that kind of stuff, torluas. So when this challenging execution, it gets hard, our timing suffers. Sometimes it's a tricky rhythm. You know, we've got, we're used to lots of dot cut stuff, but we're not, you know, when you have the cut dots or two short notes in a row, triplets. Anytime there's something like that, again, the timing suffers. So lots of different things that can make piping hard. And often we're, think, we're, we're trying to keep up with our tempo. We're trying to get all the doublings in. We're trying to figure out these tricky rhythms. And what is going to suffer there is the timing. So that's one of the areas where you're going to notice it with the ensemble is going to come apart. And you're going to think the pipers are slowing down. And you're probably right. 
because when it gets hard, that's what we do, you know, and you guys are really, really more finely in tuned to playing in metric time and, and keeping the beat. That's what we rely on you for. So, you know, there's going to be times where we're not as good. So um, that's what suffers there. Um, I'll just, this isn't on my list, but it just popped into my head here is that when it comes to the rhythm things, we're not really, we're not subdividing the same way that you are, you know, like with our dot cut. And I know James, we've talked about this before when we really get into the nitty gritty of like ensemble and, and, and matching between the two cores. You know, we talk about dot cut, like the long short in stress bays and in reels. We're not doing any kind of subdivision. Like I would say that the, the limit to the subdivision that a piper would do would be like, you know, two eighth notes, two even eighth notes and a quarter note, they need to be even. Or in a jig where you have your triplet of eighth notes, those need to be even within a jig. That's about the limit of it. We're not doing any kind of uh, further slicing and, and, and dicing when it comes to dot cuts or anything like that. So that's an area where, you know, we're, we're pretty much playing by feel. And the way I teach it is, you know, hold that dot as long as you can, hold that cut note as long as you can, and we're stretching out long beats and stress bays and stuff. So that's another area where I think that the good bands, they sort of figure it out by feel, but there isn't necessarily a lot of direct communication. It's sort of, let's try this and let's try this and we sort of work it out. So there's definitely an area there where pipers need to learn more, but if this could help you understand our limitations of our knowledge, right? Okay. Number four, piping is physically tiring. And I'm not asking for sympathy or any kind of special, uh, you know, anything here. It's just hard, you know? And then if you've ever been there on a night where pipers get their new reeds or they get new equipment, it's hard, it is really hard. And we, um, you know, it's kind of like a funny thing that pipers notice is like, as we are done playing the medley and we are just gassed you guys are back there having a great time. How about this? But you're playing, you're playing. You're like, I'm like, the last thing I can do right now is play another note. I'm dying, right? <laughs> so we joke about how you guys can't stop playing, but it's part of it is that we are just so winded, literally winded, right? So it is physically tiring. And I always tell my students when they're struggling with something, I say, listen, you want to have your pipes in really good condition so that they're efficient and they're set up properly so that they feel good but you have to be in shape that there's a physical conditioning component to any instrument, really, even something like the piano, you got to get your fingers working, but the bagpipes, it's big because it really takes a lot to blow those pipes. And um, yeah, I mean, you look at any piper come off at the end of the day and they are like soaked in sweat. It is, it is a tough go. Finally, my last one on my list is that tuning a bagpipe is very difficult. And I don't mean it's difficult, like it's hard to figure out. It's that even the people who know how to do it, it's really difficult. I wrote tuning is basically impossible. And then I scratched out basically impossible and changed it to very difficult. So, um, and you know, when we're playing, you know, playing in grade one at the world at the highest, highest level, it's really hard. It's really hard to nail it because you have all these players and all these reads, and then you have the moisture, and then you have the weather, and then you have timing. I think about it, it's a bit like ice sculpture, which is you have this block of ice and you start carving on it and it is melting. It is melting while you are doing it. Nothing that you do stays for very long. And you've all been, if you've been in a band, you've been in that final tuning, it's a bit of a mad scramble because we're trying to get all this stuff going and get out there on time and have it sound good. It's really, really hard. So um, I guess when you're, when you're in a pipe band and you guys are hanging out with pipers, you have a, a lot of uh, patience that is required and we really appreciate it. It's really hard. We want it to be so good. And um, it's maybe a little bit of a secret or it's maybe a little bit of an unknown thing to many people but so much of what makes a bagpipe sound good is the tuning. Maybe it's not a secret at all, maybe it's obvious, but we work on so many parts of our performance as pipers, but if the pipes don't sound good, 
it's really hard to enjoy all that other stuff that you're doing. Even if the medley is awesome and the medley is awesome and the ensemble and the scores are awesome and we practiced it and we put it all together and it's all awesome. If the pipes don't sound good, it's really hard to see past it. So that's why we spend so much time tuning is that it's really hard to do, but it's also really, really important. And I think, you know, if the pipes sound good, then the listener can sort of go, okay, well now what are they playing? You know, and then we can start to listen to some of the technical things that are actually going on there once our, you know, our ear is sort of receptive to listening. And if the, and if the pipes don't sound good, it's very hard to, to just get past it, right? Great. That's, That's amazing. my five things. Yori, thank you so much. I've, I've taken notes on all of that. And some of that I was like, yeah, that makes sense. sense. And other parts for that, I was like, wow, I've never thought of that. I really yeah. appreciate it. And you mentioned something about the language. And I really firmly believe that to communicate with anyone, we've got to be, first of all, talking the same language. If you don't understand German and you only speak English and someone comes to speak to you in that language, it's a foreign language. You, you don't know where to start. So essentially, we speak two very different languages, bagpipers and drummers. And between the conversation I had with your pipers and what you're having with the drummers here now, it makes me highly aware that for us to have really great success, not just musically, but as a culture, essentially we have a, a culture of, a, whether it's two people working together or a whole band of people, it's that relationship. And to have a really cohesive relationship, a harmonious one, well, we've got to understand at least the basics of the language. Hello, how are you? Thank you, please, right? And that to me is what you've just told us. And the biggest one is the last one. Tuning a bagpipe is very difficult. I can remember being one of the drummers. Why was I this? I'll tell you why in a second. But I was one of the drummers that would be like, oh my God, are they still tuning? Are you serious? Come on, I just want to play. And then we'll play like three parts of a jig and then you guys will stop and go back to tuning. I'm pulling my hair out. Why was I pulling my hair out? Because that's what my leaders were doing. They were, you know, they were essentially bad mouthing the pipers. This started way back in Ireland. Doesn't matter what country you're in, guys. This happens all around the world. And once I started chatting to pipers and they were like, well, look, if we don't tune, when we go onto the competition field, A, it's not going to sound good and B, our results are going to be reflective of that. Once I had that aha moment, I was like, oh, there's a reason to this. Be more patient, James. So I really want to highlight that one for everyone, particularly if you know you are in a band where tuning takes place. That, that's a key one. And to me, that's probably the most important lesson of all. So yeah. Really and, you know, we need to do better. And, you know, I've had a lot of success with these products that I've invented for Pipers and they're successful because they, they, they you. fill a need, but um, we got to do better. And, but I think even in the best case scenario, it's just a, it's just a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So, well, I think you do a good job of it. So keep it up. Now, Jerick, I see you've got your hand up there. I'm just going to uh, ask to unmute you. Great to see you. Hi guys. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, why pipers slow down sometimes. Um, and you also said uh, that you're like physically exhausted. And is that um, also why pipers speed up? Because I'm like, can they not hear the drummers and the rhythm and like the pace that we're setting? Because sometimes they just go off to the races and you're just like, wait, <laughs> like, doing, you know, so I was wondering if that played a big part of it as well. Yeah, so why, you know, I basically think that um, speeding up has to do with lack of control, right? So um, it's easier to just play however it comes out. However it comes out, that's easier than to actually get it lined up with the grid perfectly forever. That's just a harder thing to do. So um, I think sometimes it's maybe not hearing what's happening. You know, listening is a challenge. But sometimes it's just the inability, you know? So I think, you know, that's part of the challenge of get, having a pipe band sound really good is you have a lot of moving parts and you have a lot of different people and a lot of different skill levels and a lot of different abilities to adapt and react. I had the experience <clears throat> several times. It happened a few times in a row and I sort of, then I noticed that this was a thing that happens, which is a, a piper, their beginner piper, or whatever level they are, they're working on their tunes, they've achieved a certain level of mastery, and then they join a band, and it like completely falls apart, completely. And here's what I realized. 
When you play bagpipes in a pipe band, you cannot hear yourself. Let me say that again. When you play pipes in a pipe band, you cannot hear yourself. How can you play in a musical group when you can't hear yourself? I can't think of another musical group that exists where that's the case. And I know that that's the case at the beginning levels when I worked with my students and I've walked around and you look at someone and they know how to play the tune, but they're like maybe half a bar off. I've also had the experience where I'm going around and I'm tuning, you know, the pipe major goes around, they put the ear up to the chanters and you go up to someone and there's no sound coming out. And you look up and it's like, they think there's sound coming out, but they don't know. Well, how can that be? Well, cause you can't hear. And I've played at the highest level at a band at the world championship level, grade one. And this is what happens. Is that my D? I don't know, is, that you? is it your D? I can't tell. I hear a bad D, do you hear the bad D? Yeah, I hear it. Whose is it? Is it mine? And then you wave over, you call over for the whoever's tuning and they come over and they listen to your D and they go, sounds fine to me. And it's someone all the way across the circle. Huh. That's at the world championship level. So can you imagine playing a sport? Like, you know, you kick the soccer ball and you're like, did I score? I don't know. I think I scored. Did he score? We're not really sure. Did he score or not? Did I catch the ball or not? I don't know. How can you get better when you don't know what, what you're doing is working? Yeah. It's a fundamental challenge, right? Because so, so what I wanted, what I tell my, my Piper students when they get in the band is that you cannot play by sound. Impossible. You watch, you follow visually. And how do you know if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing? And you can try this right now. Close your eyes and touch your nose. How can you do that? What's well, because, well, you know where your body is. You don't need to see your finger touch your nose. You, can, you, you have body awareness. And that's the main sense that you need to have as a piper playing in a pipe band because you cannot hear yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's with you guys, maybe it's more visual. You can see with the sticks, maybe the sound of an individual drum stands out more because there's not so much saturation of sound. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to one of my piping students who's a professor of music and we were talking about this thing. He said, he, could, he just got really fascinated. He said, I can't think of another musical group that exists where people can't hear themselves. Mm -hmm. like, he's like, we got to do a research study on this. I was like, great. Fascinating. So what I recommended for those students is that they get some noise canceling earbuds and play with white noise. It's very fascinating. You should try it. It's fascinating. You know, they say that people that are missing a sense will have a heightened sense. Their other senses will be heightened. And I think that can happen too, is we're so used to, if you, especially if you play at home alone in a, an environment where you can really hear yourself, you get the sound becomes the primary sense. And that makes sense that in a musical discipline that the sound would be the primary sense, but that's problematic for pipers when you step into a pipe band because you have, you're basically deaf. That's amazing. I did not ever consider that. You I, rem I remember like the week of the worlds or maybe it's even final tuning. It's like, is it my D? Is it my D? I hear a D. We all hear a D. Whose D is it? And it was someone on the other side of the circle had a D that was out. And that's it amazing. sounded right there. You can't tell. There's a major information problem. I Amazing. think in psychology, it's, it's called the signal to noise ratio. There's just so much noise. You can't pick out the signal. Like, where is it? Is it me? I don't know. I think I'm fine. <laughs> right? So there's a lot of challenges that go into that. Some of it might be players not listening appropriately. But don't take it automatically as, don't they hear what we're doing? Maybe. But maybe they just don't have the chops to be able to pull it back. It's quite challenging to be able to, if you're used to tumbling ahead with your tempo, it's sort of, I think of it as like a toddler learning to walk, they just bop, 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 and then they fall on their face, right? Well, why don't they slow down? Well, because they don't, it's harder to do, do it with control, right? So that's part of the problem there. Makes sense. Great question there, Jerick, I thank you. I'm getting fired up now, Peter. James. <laughs> I love it. And Peter's gonna ask a question here shortly as well. I'll just see a couple of, Carter T just said, Yori, in relation to what you were talking to with Jerrica there, is that why pipers tend to be either solo or band players and not both? Uh, well, first of all, I don't, the, I don't know if that's so much the case anymore. Certainly there used to be a very big division between the top soloists and the band players. It's 
it's much more overlap now. I think there, I think there are a lot of different reasons that players prefer one or the other, you know, the way I describe it is there's a lot of overlap between solo piping and piping in a band. There's a, a tremendous amount of overlap and there's some very, very significant differences as well. You know, um, the key thing in playing in a band and, and I, I, as a piper, and I suppose it's very, I, I, I suspect it's true for drummers as well, but it's the ability to, to blend and to, to match and to fit in, right? Unless you're the leader, you have to be blending and matching and watching and fitting in with someone else. Absolutely. Right? And I suppose even if you are the leader, even if you're the lead tip, you gotta be playing to the pipe major. And even if you're the pipe major and I've led a band, you just really can't do your own thing and expect everyone to follow you. You gotta be, you have to be, I think if you're gonna be effective, finding something that works for everybody to play with you. So it's a different style, but again, there's a lot of overlap. And, you know, I did 19 years in a band and loved it. And now I've, you know, retired from band playing for now, but uh, really different, really different. Thanks for that, Yuri. I see Hugh, we'll come to you in a second there, Hugh McCallum over in Scotland. There's people from all over. I want to salute all of you who showed up live. Like we've got Hawaii, a couple of Hawaiians on here. We've got East Coast and West Coast of North America. We've got Scotland, England. We've got down here in Australia, New Zealand. Um, there's a, one of my good friends from Albuquerque, New Mexico there. So good to see you guys. So thanks for showing up live. And if you're on replay or you're over on Facebook watching, if you've got any questions, please do just tag Yuri or I on those questions and we'll come back to you in the next day or so. Uh, but Peter, let's uh, let's just, I'll see if I can unmute you there, my friend. Good to see you over in Hawaii. Thank you, aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Hi, Yuri. Um, Hi, Peter. <laughs> uh, I think our paths uh, uh, cross almost with uh, one of the bands on Oahu. Uh, and here's my son, Brendan. Um, hey, Brendan. Anyway. <laughs> So um, to tag on to, uh, I think, Jerrica's uh, question uh, about, you know, listening and, and the pipers or even the drum core speeding up or slowing down, when, um, but, but specifically from our uh, perspective, I'm, I'm the, the lead tip here on Maui, um, and, and I've been in a couple other bands as well. And so when people say, listen to the drummers, right, how can we speak to pipers and clarify that? request of them, what should they listen to from the drummers? What I always um, say is, you know, that the snare drummers, we're leaning forward to keep the momentum going. And the, the midsection's almost leaning forward a little bit more because they have the bigger drums where the sound travels a little maybe slower for them, you know. Um, but what, what could pipers, when we say listen to the drummers, what should, what could we point out? Well, I would ask you like, so what do you want us to listen to? If somebody said, hey, listen to the drummers, it's like, well, what? What am I listening to? There's a lot of stuff going on back there. I don't understand any of it, <laughs> right? So what's the deal? I mean, the things that pop out to us would be, mm. okay, uh, like I said in my list, it's like, we know when it's good and we love that, but and then what we tend to notice when it's not good, it's like, that doesn't sound together. And the question is, are we slowing down? Are you speeding up? Like who, what's going on here? Are you guys slowing down? So we got to somehow figure out the, the problem. Um, a real uh, classic one would be you guys have some big accent and it's like, is that where it's supposed to go? Cause I don't like, that doesn't seem like that's the right spot. So mm -hmm. it could be, it's not in the right spot. You guys are hitting it, you know. I, James, is it a thing that you guys, when you hit something really loud, you like to hit it a little bit early? Because that seems like that's sometimes something that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Often when we um, accent, we come down with more velocity. And so we do tend to like get there a little bit earlier. Yeah. And this takes me back to what you were talking about last week. When we started, you were asking James, you know, about visual. And this was when we we're talking to the pipers about what the drummer should be doing. And by the end of the conversation, we come up with this really cool thing that I think could help everybody. So one, you've got the pipe major who calls the tempo. It says quick march. So all the pipers should be looking at the pipe major, every single one of them. Secondly, you've got the bass drummer who should only be looking at the pipe major. You've got the tenor drummers who should be only looking at the pipe major. You've got the leading drummer who should only be looking at the pipe major, even if his snare drummers are driving him or her crazy, keep an eye on your job, which is metric accuracy. The only people in the band not to look at the pipe major's foot should be 
the drum core. They're watching their leader. So there's a there's an intra core metric visual there. They're watching their leading drummer for all the accuracy. Pipers are watching their pipe major for accuracy, both finger work and footwork. But it comes back to making sure that there's one leader. Some people say, follow the bass drum. The bass drum's there to set the tempo. And I disagree. I, I feel that the pipe major is the conductor of the band and we must follow a visual. So if they have a weak foot or a, an eager foot or a bit of an inconsistent foot when they're tapping, that's an area for development for them. But I think, Yuri, that just took me back to that conversation. I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, so if, you know, again, we need, Peter, just to try to answer your question a little bit more precisely, or maybe just throw it back to you, which is like, we need to know, like, what do you want us to listen to? Because if you're telling us, hey, listen to us, then there's something that isn't going. And if you think, oh, hey, we're not, you could say, hey, we're coming down on this big accent on the start of the fifth bar where we all come in. So, you know, listen to that. But there's, a, but there's also an inherent problem with that is that pipers don't come in and out. We play continuously. So we just can't decide, okay, we're going to hit that one note on time. Because if, if, we're, if we're early or late, there's stuff that leads up to it, right? So I think the key to ensemble and unison is the beat. That's, the, that's where it all comes is the beat. That's the place where everybody overlaps, right? We're doing our thing. You guys are doing your thing, sometimes matching, sometimes diverging and then returning. The bass drummers and tenors are doing their own thing. It all is the beat. That's that's like the, that's where we overlap. That's where I think we, we should key into. And what I tell my piping students is that if you're gonna play in a band, here's what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to play your tunes correctly, consistently with the metronome. You need to have a very clear sense of where the beat is, because what you're going to do is you're going to step into the circle and you're going to be playing that tune. And instead of watching the app, you're going to be watching your pipe major's foot, maybe slightly faster, maybe slightly slower. But if you have good rhythm between within the beats and you're consistent with your own beat, then it's just a matter of synchronizing then with the pipe major. And I think that that is the case for for good ensemble, which is like, you guys are doing what you're doing. We're doing what we're doing. If you guys have the ability to, to play on a, a solid beat, again, the pipe major might be going a little slower, faster one day from the next, but if you can line up for that, it's sort of like he sets the metronome or she sets the metronome. And uh, then that's where you line up. It's a great question, Peter. And the one thing I would suggest uh, in discussions with your pipe major um, or pipers, just so that everyone gets uh, an understanding, is there's three key areas I look at with drumming. So you've got rhythm, which also includes your timing. Then you've got your phrasing, and then you've got your technical execution. Now, vastly, uh, most of our time is focused on technical execution. And that's why a lot of pipe band drummers often struggle with a transition to drum kit playing initially because there's so much movement and rhythm and counter rhythms. We get too focused on the technique. So what I would ask your pipers to do is don't focus on our technical stuff. Let us worry about windmills, flange, random cues, all that stuff. But if they want to have a discussion in terms of what they should listen for, rhythm and timing, those things should, should line up. They should be in harmony, uh, both piping melody and the drumming, even if we're not drum, we're not pipe centric for the whole composition, they should line up. And then secondly, phrasing, that's the other thing they should listen for. So that they, those were certainly discussions I would be having with my former pipe major, was like, how do we play the two, four march? And so for him, he wanted to play it like, sorry about the singing, and the right? So he was really focused. He's like, I don't care about the downbeat. I don't really care about that. I want the upbeat. I want the lift. I want this, that's what I want. So he was very focused on that. So I had to then think, okay, my compositions have got to be reflective of that. My accenting has got to be reflective of that. Yeah, I still want to hit some downbeats here, <laughs> but I've got to give him what he is visualizing musically. So to me, those are the two key areas, phrasing, rhythm, timing, making sure you guys are talking about what you're hearing, seeing, feeling in those two areas. Great for ensemble, great for, for team rapport. I just see Darren's got a comment in there. He says he feels that the pipers in his band don't have a good sense of the beat. Well, that would be not a surprise, depending on the level of your band and the level of your pipers in your band. So, if, but if a piper is struggling to keep a beat, 
to say, hey, listen to this crazy stuff we're doing in the back end. This will help you. I don't think that's what they need. I think they need to go and figure out, get the metronome and go, can you play this tune with the metronome and tap your foot? That's what you got to do. And for pipers, I think the challenge is, can you play this tune on the pipes twice through with the metronome and with your foot? That's sort of a good starting point. If you can't do that, you got fundamental problems. You know, you don't know the thing well enough and you don't have, you know, you just don't have the sufficient level of mastery to even get to the point where you can have a successful collaboration with anybody, right? So James and I would be able to play together. In fact, any of us would be able to play together if we could say, we'll, we'll pick a tune and then we pick the, the tempo we're gonna tune it, we're gonna play it at. You go off, you learn your bit, I'll learn my bit. And then we come together. If you can play it solid at that tempo, and I can play it solid at that tempo, we're going to be close. We're going to be pretty close. Now, there's obviously lots of nuance and lots of practice that goes into it, but I think you're putting the, you know, the, the what do they say, putting the cart before the horse. If you're trying to get into all sorts of detailed stuff and people can't even play the tune steady start to finish. So I think that's a starting point. And I've had some, very good success over the last year or so with a few of my students who have struggled with timing for a long time. And the secret was play with the metronome app all the time from until further notice, right? Because what can happen is you just start to drift. You just drift off and you don't know you're drifting. And the metronome is a really, really, um, powerful uh, diagnostic tool because you know instantly when you're off of it. And a lot of people will resist playing with the metronome because they think, oh, it's impossible. I can't play with that thing. Well, that that means you need it even more, right? 100%. So, and speaking of yeah. that, Yori actually has a, a free metronome. You can go onto the um, Apple store and you can download it straight from there. It's called the Piper's Metronome. So if you guys are interested in, and you don't have a metronome, there's a lot of features on there that are not on a standard metronome that apply to us pipe band folk. So the Piper's Metronome on the, the Apple store. Yeah, it's on the, uh, it's on Apple. It's also on Android. It's free. We, you know, we want you to pay for it. It's very expensive uh, and we think it's worth it. Um, but you can test basically all the features for free on there. One of the features that you can't use in the free version is you, you can't, uh, in the paid version, you can create custom sets. You can create MSRs, medleys with custom transitions. It's, we put a lot into it. I think it's, I, I think you'll really like it. If you end up getting the paid version and you don't think it's worth the $20, email me. I will sort it out. I've never had anybody who wanted their money back. So I, I really do believe in the app. So, and James has been great in, you know, letting us know how it works for drummers and so far so good. It's been great. Yeah, thank you, Yuri. And just be, before we wrap up, um, Robert Perry says, we played Name That Tune. So we play unique customized scores for all our marches. So the drum corps would play the march and the pipers had to name the march we were playing. It helped some of the pipers draw connections with what we do. It may not work if you use mass band drum scores, but what a great idea. Yeah, so be, yeah it's, uh, there's a lot, you know, I think this is a great opportunity, what we're starting here, James, you know, the last couple of weeks with our two uh, communities. Um, I think there's a real opportunity here for a lot of improvement because the, there's such a lack of, you know, cross pollination here of ideas and information. So I think this is a really good start. 100% agree. And just before we do wrap up, uh, I wanted to ask you just about the online contest. So obviously, I've, I've been helping you in terms of getting the drumming stuff together. I've got a lineup of judges, which I'll share with you guys that are pretty phenomenal judge judging lineup. But when is the entry deadline? Great. So we're talking about the World Online Piping and Drumming Championships. This is our 10th contest. I started it in 2011 with pipers only. Then brought James on as my co-chair or the drumming chair, my co-founder. And uh, we got, yeah, side, tenor, bass, pipe bands, and piping. The deadline for registration is April 22nd. So, yeah, week and a half. And the way it works is that um, if you've seen any of these online, other online contests that are, are, are popping up, you know, we, we invented this format, which is you register in advance, 
you, uh, you, you, know, you pick your grade, you pick your event, you register in advance, and then you have a deadline to submit your video and your video is recorded uh, by YouTube or you record it and upload it to YouTube. So there's no limit to the number of attempts you can take. You can you know, take as many attempts as you want. Um, we recommend you don't wait to the last minute so you get the full experience, uh, the positive benefits of doing something like this, which is hopefully to record it, listen back, maybe work on a few things and try it again. Uh, and then we submit the videos to our panel of world-class judges, world champions, gold medal winners, famous lead drummers, pipe majors, some of the very best in our, in our pipe band world. And then they watch all the videos and they will um, award the placings. Every competitor gets a detailed sheet of comments. So that's really the number one reason that our uh, participants enter the contest is to get the feedback. You know, something like 90% of our previous uh, competitors uh, said they had a great or excellent time in the contest. So it's really a great way to do something fun, do a personal challenge, you know, set, set a specific goal with a specific deadline to push yourself and get some great feedback. You know, we have some really great, I won't go through the whole list of piping judges. We have something like 40 judges, but really some of the best of the best, pipe major Richard Parks, um, Alistair Dunn, um, pipe major Terry Lee, Willie McCallum. I mean, just Callum Beaumont. I, I won't mention anybody, but there's a whole list of, you know, 25 other amazing pipers on there. And we and, and James has organized some really, really fantastic drumming judges as well. So the, the video deadline is May 12th. So if you're thinking, oh, I don't have enough time to pick my tunes and get everything organized, you have a month now. So I really encourage you. And if you're feeling like you want to be part of the competition, but you're not really into competing, we have an option for you as well. We have an evaluation only option. So what that means is that you'll get a sheet from one of our world-class judges. Um, it's You still register in advance, but you just pick the event that says evaluation only, and you pay your registration fee, and the process will be the same, except you will not be judged against anybody you won't receive any placing and we won't publish your web, your uh, videos on the website. So that's if you just want to get an opportunity to get some great feedback from one of our judges. So I encourage you. And if you haven't competed before, that's maybe a fun way to sort of get your, you know, dip your toes into it a little bit. You can have the experience of going through and you're essentially making like a competition video, which is you're going to pick your tune and work it up and get ready to do a really good performance, but instead of doing it live, you do it in front of the phone or the camera, laptop, and then you'll, you know, get that great experience of getting some feedback from one of the best drummers around or pipers, if you're a piper. So it's, I think a, a cool way to be part of something fun, challenge yourself and get a, you know, some great pointers to keep you inspired and motivated and, you know, on the right track. And we pick our judges. We, we really try to do a good job of picking judges who we think will are not only have the great qualifications and credentials, but also someone who, you know, is a great uh, educator and uh, instructor. So give some good feedback that way. Thank you so much, Yori. Thank you. And on that note, just to let you guys know who the judges are, so you can kind of uh, think, think it through before you do enter. So on the bass and tenor side, we've got John Nickel. So John was the bass drummer with SFU uh, through the 90s when they were winning their, their first world championships right up till 99. Blake Schmidt will be judging tenor. So Blake played with SFU for, I think, around 20 years. Uh, phenomenal player, teacher, can play snare drum as well up to a grade one level. Nicola Cairns, who played with SFU, Spirit of Scotland, Auckland and District, Scottish Power. Uh, she's a, a great player and teacher. And Matt Bellia, also a very amazing player from the East Coast uh, of America and Canada, I should say. And then snare, we've got Gordon Parks, former leading drummer of Field Marshal Montgomery and RSPBA judge. Duncan Miller, formerly of SFU, played there for many years and is on the RSPBA adjudication panel. Gavin Node, top 12 world solo drumming finalist who also plays with Field Marshal Montgomery. Gordon Craig, former RSPBA adjudicator. Michael Jenkins, current leading drummer of New Zealand's uh, winning band, Canterbury Caledonian. Dean Smith, world solo juvenile champion and has been with Field Marshal Montgomery for a long time. 
Harold Gillespie, former leading drummer of Victoria Police, the Master Blasters, 1998 world champions, a phenomenal teacher, educator, and judge, RSPBA, former RSPBA judge, and Kieran Mordant, who is an RSPBA drumming and ensemble judge from Ireland. So we've got a, a wide range of adjudicators who will all give you guys feedback on your performances if you, if you enter, of course. And uh, if you've got any questions on that, either get in touch with your or I, or you're concerned about something or not sure, and if you want to just put a comment below if you're on Facebook here and you're watching this in replay, tag us or drop us a direct message. Uh, we're all about just trying to help you guys cross that barrier of thinking to do it, to getting out and doing it. And it's not for everybody. I get that. Not everybody enjoys solos and that's cool. But for those that are thinking about it and need some help, just shout out. Yeah, I would encourage you if you're just at all on the fence, just go for it, you know. And uh, um, we really try to make it a positive experience. Once you register, you get added to a special email list for registered competitors, and we will give you all the information you need. We've learned, like I said, this has been our 10th one. So we've learned and we've really tried to streamline the process. We have a really, you know, some really helpful tips for how to make a good video. You know, for most people, it's the, it's your phone is going to be the best thing. Oh, look at those little guys on there. Um, <laughs> Two little cuties. Uh, my, my rascals. But um, if, Really, your iPhone is probably your best thing or an iPad or a laptop. So you don't need any special equipment. Uh, and then we'll, if you haven't uploaded a, a video to YouTube before, we'll show you how to do that. And you can make it unlisted so that nobody will see it except for the judges. And, you know, and, um, and then, yeah, just kind of kind of walk you through the whole process. And we really try to make it a positive, fun experience and, you know, this last year, there's been lacking in a lot of positive, fun experiences that we're used to, right? So this has been a really cool thing to be able to be part of something that's really big. And when, you know, when the videos start coming around the deadline, it's just, you know, I'm clicking on the links to make sure the video links work. And it's just really cool to see so many pipers and drummers from around the world, you know, doing this and putting in so much effort and care and, um, some really great video backgrounds too, to see the, you know, people from all over the world. I love the videos where people in just their little bedroom with all their stuff hanging everywhere, but then I also love the videos where they're out and, you know, in front of the Sydney Harbor Bridge or, you know, Table Mountain in Cape Town or it's just a really cool uh, geographic location. So that's also a fun thing you can do is show off your hometown, so. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Yuri. And I just want to make sure we go back to Hugh McCallum because he did put his hand up. It's almost 3 a.m. in the UK. Hugh is committed, man. So I got to unmute you. Well done, my man. <laughs> I've just unmuted you. So hopefully that'll, well, you might have to there click a wee button. There we go. Hey, you can hear me now? Absolutely. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for um, tipping me on. And no, it's just to, just to go back to uh, a couple of points that Yuri made earlier on. Um, and thanks, thanks for taking the time really to, to address it. Um, and it was just like when you're saying like the pipers don't know much of what the drummers are doing. And that kind of flows back is that the drummers possibly don't know much of what the pipers are doing as well. So, and uh, I'm kind of teaching, uh, I teach a lot of drummers. And it's also, and like with, between myself and the, the local pipe instructor, we set up a new pipe band and I've had this kind of niggling thought at the back of my head that never came to fruition because of the whole kind of the coronavirus with COVID and stuff, we couldn't actually practice together. But I had this thought of maybe right, we should swap roles. So I should, would it help? Or have you had any experience of this, of a, a, a drumming tutor or drumming leader um, teaching pipers how to play the basics of drummings and at the same time the piping tutor and the pipe major teaching the drum corps the basics of piping just to get that kind of level of understanding of okay we do a, a swiss rough and that works out at the same piping embellishment for whatever whatever it is um i, I think that's a great one, idea yeah it's I, just I, one I, of I these things it's... that it's just one of these things I've had in my head. That, you know, mm -hmm. Has this been thought about before? Is it discussed? Because the, the only person I know that can do both is Stuart Little, who's <laughs> obviously a, a fantastic piper, 
and if it has to fight major, and not no disrespect, you might do it, but I just don't know it. Um, but he's also a fantastic drummer. No, certainly, I think that's one of Stewart's magical, like you know, abilities. Well, it's not magic, but it's a, it seems magical. It's it's is it multi <laughs> multi instrumental uh, talents, and certainly that would help him. And I think that there are. I think there are more people that have some crossover knowledge that's maybe not so publicly known, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think, I mean, I think it'd be very interesting. I don't know how, there's a, there's a pretty big technical, there's a pretty big investment in time in the early stages, you know. Like if I was going to yeah. show you guys the chanter, it's like we're working on finger placement for a while before we really get into stuff that I think would be <laughs> more instantly or more... Um, readily applicable but i think stuff like what we're doing here would be very 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 useful to talk about okay all right pipers these are some of the options that we're looking at for this break so let's like this is what we've been doing but it hasn't really been working so we could also do this we could simplify this mm -hmm. or we have you know, so these are some options here that we're working, you know, if you're maybe you're writing your own scores or maybe you're working with James or somebody who's writing some scores for you, you could have some options and go, well, this is more of the straight line where it matches. This is sort of an intermediate sort of syncopation diversion thing. And then this one is really wild and cool and more challenging. Yeah. So we can try them out and we can see where they, where they fit. Um, yeah, maybe you guys would like to know, you know, maybe, you know, I could take you through and I could show you some of the things that, well, this is what pipers think about when we're playing stress bass. Like, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are not mm -hmm. playing loud because we can't. Like, this is how we emphasize yeah. the strong yeah. beats. Like, this would be playing it straight. This would be playing it with sort of moderate, a moderate expression. And this would be like the real heavy expression. And it, there's no dynamics there. So just really sort of, you know, I think why pipes and drums work so well together is that we accommodate or we compensate for the limitations of the other core mm -hmm. we have no dynamics you have no yeah. you have no melody or harmony well where do we overlap is on the rhythmic stuff so we got to make sure that that's really really dialed in right so yeah. i think it's a very very interesting idea and you know just thinking right off the bat you know i i'd love to learn a little bit of, of drumming but i think it would maybe be more Depends how much time you have to invest. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Into, but but certainly more communication and more understanding, even if we're not actually developing the technical playing ability cross core, but certainly the ability to understand. I mean, I'd love to sit with you guys or James and say, James, play me, you know. Give me Highland Wedding from six different drummers and explain why how they're different and the scores and why this one's good and this one stinks, you know? <laughs> or go through and watch some videos from the world and show me five things that you think are awesome that we should all do and show me five yeah. things that are horrible that we shouldn't do. You know, so like just just give me some more um information and and some sort of lay it out. Again, like I'm not an interior designer, but I could walk into a house and I could go. I love this. And someone mm. could say, yeah, well, you always love stuff like this. This is why you love this, because you <laughs> like this yeah. kind of thing. Versus saying, yeah, yeah. I don't like this. I don't know why. And they could say, well, it's because this is not your color scheme. You don't know why, but I know why, because I'm the expert, right? So I'd love to have more of an understanding technically and more explicitly of the things that I maybe feel on a more subjective or gut level, if that makes sense. That's amazing. Hey, what a great yeah. question, Hugh. Like, totally, totally. absolutely phenomenal. And I do believe, you know, you already said understanding. And I, I, I bring it back mm -hmm. to that. I think the more we can understand about each other's instrument, the better. A few people have been writing in the chat here, including Peter, Robert, and Anne Marie, talking about singing and humming. And I truly believe for us to understand each other, we've got to get closer in language. The way we do that is we learn to, you heard me doing a horrible version of a 2-4 march there, but that was me humming the pipe tune, right? That's my way of relating. And it would be great for pipers to be able to do a little bit of the same with the drum speak. And so the understanding lifts. I personally learned a bit of pipes, um, very basic, uh, because I was motivated to do so when I was about 15. But I soon realized that for me to go down the mastery route of learning the pipe band snare drum and trying to achieve what I could there, I couldn't do both at a reasonable level. 
and certainly couldn't do both at a mastery level. So I decided, okay, I've learned a few basics, but I don't have the time to invest in it. And you already mentioned that it comes down to time. If you've got endless amounts of time, definitely learn both. But depends what your motivations are, depends what your time is. But a great idea there, Hugh. So thanks for that. You know, well, so Hugh, first of all, thumbs up, teaching. You know, you guys are the heroes on the front lines, you know, teaching and especially beginners and starting up a pipe band. I mean, that is heroic, heroic efforts there to start up a pipe band. You know, I would think at the very least, your 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 piping instructor or maybe some of the leaders, you could spend, that's where you want to spend the time. You know, if you really want to, if you want to sort of get the best bang for your buck there, I would say with the with the leaders and the instructors and make sure you guys are on the same page because then you know, all the drumming players that sort of is comes from that lead drummer and that drumming instructor, just the way that the pipers are all basically following from there. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it just kind of following on from what you said before about that, like when pipers don't know much about drumming, then they kind of fold in. That was like your number one point. And then your, your number two point was knowing when it's in the pocket and it sounds good, but when it's not, right. you don't know why. That's and right. it's also Absolutely. it's the same. I just kind of thought. I mean, if even if the drum corps learn how to play the scale, and uh, and the you guys should learn how to tune a set of bagpipes. That'd give you some real. Yeah, that'd be fun. Real, yeah. Yeah. Here, go blow in this new read. Go blow in no, this new no. read. I'll stand back here and watch. And uh, like no, no, you're all right. You're, you're all right. You're all right. You're right. <laughs> well, you're. I just want to say a massive thank you. Thank you to everybody. That has shown up live. Thank you to everyone who's watched on replay. Uh, we're very fortunate to have that time with Yuri, so I really appreciate it. And if you guys have got any questions about what we've talked about, please do you know tag us in the comments below in Facebook or get in touch with either of us about anything we've talked about. You know we're we're very much an open book, so stay in touch. And for those who are entering the competition, wishing you the very best of luck. Enjoy the process because it's the process that matters. It's filming that that MSR or that march and then refilming it and then learning about it and refilming it again. That's where the gold happens. It's not the results. It's, it's the journey and the process. So enjoy that. Yuri, thanks it's for meeting me, man. You bet. Hey, James, thanks for having me. I'll just throw out the website. It's bagpipelessons.com slash competition. And uh, everything you need to know is there. Send us an email. Find me on Facebook, Instagram, all that jazz. I just started a TikTok them, account. <laughs> Go and follow Yuri. And if you've got any bagpiping friends, send them his way. You know, he's got an amazing group there on Facebook and obviously on his website, got so many amazing resources. So please do do them a favor and just send them a link to bagpipelessons.com. Great to see you guys. And thanks a million again, Yuri. Mahalo. Mahalo. Hey, folks. <laughs>